The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> As I near the end of my career, as a parish pastor, as I wind up what will inevitably be a last day, it's important, I think it's critical, that we do this passage together. And that somehow you help me to understand what it is that prevents growth that becomes the roadblock in relationships, that causes people to stumble. Because surely in the 21st century, the last thing one would ever do is shame someone. We would never want to shame someone. And here we have the Son of God shaming someone. A religious leader. What would that be like? Can you even wrap your head around it? For almost two decades, 18 years, this woman was tethered by a deformity where people in that day and age thought surely she had done something wrong. So I wonder what kind of woman she was as a teenager. That she was a party girl. Surely. Satan's punishing her. She was bent over. So think about what it would be like to live a life bent over, unable to see the blue sky. Think about what it would be like to be bent over, only to see what was left, the dirty roads and the trash discarded, left behind, because they didn't recycle back then. The Bible tells us that she entered into the synagogue and that she did so because there was an itinerant preacher, a prophet, and the word was getting around, and she did what she always does. She went to church. She went to church every Sabbath. She went to the synagogue 18 years every Sabbath, bent over, restricted from being able to see what was going on. But she heard that there was this guy in town, so she went. And the Bible tells us it quickly moves through it, doesn't it? Quickly moves through her condition. Quickly moves through. Jesus, the Word of God, capital W, living Word of God, is distracted by this woman. And he was at his job reading about himself reading the Torah, reading scripture, and with all of that, reading the word of God, the seriousness of the Son of God, reading the word of God, 
distracted by this woman. And he attends to her and gives her her name, daughter of Abraham, Abraham, the father of faith. Things hoped for yet unseen, things not quantified or qualified, no Excel spreadsheet to make faith happen. It's trust in the Lord with all your heart. Spreadsheets can deceive you, so can your heart. And that's why scripture says, guard your hearts, for they are the wellspring of life. It had to have been an embarrassing moment to ask her to come forward in the midst of the crowds. These are the people that she knew out of the corner of her eye, she would see them. She would see the adults making fun, making comments, not verbally. Their stares communicated exactly what she was afraid they were going to communicate, that she was not worthy, that she was a visible example of sins that have taken place. Even from the children, now they, she could see a little bit better because they're down here and her eyes could meet out of the corner of her eyes. Imagine her eyes meeting Jesus' eyes as she comes from that position being focused on the ground, rising up. When Jesus says, woman, I got a kick out of that. Woman, you are freed from your sickness. Instantaneously freed. Have you had those moments when all you had to do was hear the word? Something happened and instantaneously there was a shift in your heart. Instantaneously. Now, for some of you, this won't be a big deal. For some of you, this will be earth-shattering. In one of my programs, my postdoctoral program, I was doing a thing with human sexuality and working on credentials to be a sex therapist. And it's not about the act. It's way better. And I had two gentlemen in my office, and that was not the most common thing for me. These two guys came in, and I told them up front, I'm probably not the best therapist for you because I don't actually understand the dynamic. And they said, you're the guy we want. And little by little, they taught me. And in the first session, this is what did it, folks, instantaneously. Guy said, now these are, these are squared away Gentlemen, these are very intelligent, high-level professionals. He said, you know, when I see an attractive woman, I think to myself, there's an attractive woman. But when I think of love, I think of this man. And instantaneously, everything that I had in my past, all of that which I grew up with, everything that I knew from central Pennsylvania, all the jokes in the locker room. We didn't have stalls back then. We just snapped each other with towels. I don't know what you guys did. But we have, I didn't understand. But in that moment, it all became clear that love wins. And it won my heart from that point forward. I knew that my mother and father I can't say this too loudly. I was born premature almost three months. And I found it. It was written in my parents' Bible the day they got married and the day I was born. And they didn't add up. And then I realized, again, with Dr. B. Hollander Goldfein, Probably one of the finest therapists I've ever met. B's expression when I told her the story, she said, oh, your mother must have been so afraid. 
and it all clicked. No wonder my mother was as anxious as she was. She was afraid to go home and say, Dad, Mom, now this is coal regions. This is Pine Grove, Tremont, Llewellyn. I mean, Tremont has six people in it, right? Llewellyn has two and a half people in it. Pine Grove has 14. They're the metropolis. And they are very rigid. And my grandfather was Irish. Can you imagine my mother saying, hey, Dad, you're going to be a grandfather. Instantaneously understood what was going on. I think for this woman, instantaneously, she and many in the room probably caught on because the bondage that had her restricted for all those years. She was loosed, set free, and was able to see right into the face of Jesus. To simply offer the praise that was desired and deserved to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well done, Lord. Well done. Jesus knew how to meet her right where she was and bring her to the place where he desired her to be. But, right, there's always a but. Sometimes it has two T's. There's always a but. What glorifies God only infuriates the synagogue official. Infuriates the synagogue official because his service had been disrupted. And worse, this guy was healing on the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to do that. The only one that works on the Sabbath is the synagogue official. Boy, there's a contradiction. We don't do it that way here. Shouldn't have this man been wiping the tears away from his eyes rather than shouting, raising his voice in protest? Did he miss the miracle? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think his eyes were so fixed on the formality, the rules, the time-tested tested honored traditions. Yeah. I think that he lost sight of being able to see the incredible display of power that God was providing right before his eyes. How many times have you been in a room and you've thought to yourself, did you just miss what was said? Did you just, did you not see? Did you not hear? How many times? Your leaders here at St. John's are being taught something. It's called the pawn process. And the bottom line is this. Jesus Christ had a present tense mindset. So while it's important to have strategy, and while it's important to plan, what's more important is to pay attention with what's going on right in front of you. How many songs have been written about fathers who missed out on their children's lives because they were too busy? How many songs have been written about women who were too busy that they missed out on their kids' lives. Look it up. You'll find out that women get a pass on that one. But I'm not sure there's a female in this room, a mother in this room, that wouldn't say, boy, I don't want to miss anything in my kids' life. And I love it when dads say, I don't want to miss anything in my kids' lives. But yet our families are split, and they go in all kinds of different directions. So in the end, the kids don't have the parents together as their model. They have parents but they're both going in different directions. How long can that work? Jesus calls this guy out because he didn't know the palm process. He didn't know to look for what God was up to right now. What's the miracle happening right beside you and you are afraid to admit it. You're so timid to admit 
what's going on between you and the person even seated beside you. You're so afraid. You're locked up. You're in bondage. Me too. Me too. You don't think I know this? You don't think I feel this text? Words from my dad. My dad's birthday is next week. Well, it, is it still his birthday? Even though he's gone? Well, next week. Anyway, I don't know how to say that yet because this is the first time I'd ever have to uh, I've never said it. But my dad used to say to people, because he's a senior and I'm a junior, he's the real Bob Mockamer. And I always thought, what a knucklehead. But he is the real Bob Mockamer. Because nobody ever had a doubt about the kindness in his heart. I never heard a person question my father's integrity. Not once. Not once. Never heard a person doubt. I mean, he would embarrass us all the time. He was outgoing, sociable. He'd talk to everybody. The guy couldn't walk down a street without saying hello to everybody. The real Bob Mockamer. He didn't live in bondage. He didn't let anything hold him back. He really didn't. He wasn't afraid. Jesus says, you hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and leave it out to give it water? Don't you feed your animals on the Sabbath? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, there comes the credential, one of your own, a part of your community, are you really going to take someone in your own family and keep her in bondage for yet another 18 years? Instead, he says, be free, be free. It's hard to talk about freedom with a bunch of white people. It really is. Lutherans, right? What's our nickname? The Frozen Chosen. <laughs> Perfect opportunity for an artist. Somebody around here has got to be able to get a crayon or, or paintbrush or something and draw the picture of this woman's total physical flexibility juxtaposed to the rigidity of the religious leader's spiritual posture. Why is it that it seems to me, maybe to you too, that so many religious people are most resistant to the power of God? It's the religious people that somehow want to control the power of God. Maybe that's the case here, right? Are they so neatly organized with their files, their task lists, their database, and their calendars that they leave no room for the miracle to take place, the supernatural, the spontaneity of God? Maybe that's the answer. Maybe I just came up with it and didn't even know it was coming. No room. No room in the end of their hearts for the birth of something unexpected that can only come from heaven. Well, there's an ending I did not anticipate. That ending came about because of you, Doug. Woman. Why can't I say that in the office? Well, see, now if Jesus can do that, why can't I do that? Woman, Becky Shirey. Could you see that one? Rodney, try it out for us. <laughs> Jay, come on. Just lean over there and say, Woman, what's for lunch? Not going to happen. Yeah.
Your team this past weekend really were quite spectacular. They put the 2023 core plan together. It's about freedom. It's about the promises that we find in baptism. It's about the commitment we make <clears throat> as people of God to one another. I think worship is my definition, and I think it was Amy Grant too, worship. The inability to withhold praise. The inability. So what is it that causes you to laugh and it comes out of you and you say, oh my gosh, did I just laugh out loud? Worship. True worship, that's what it should be. If you can walk into this sanctuary at the end of 2023 and say the only thing that I got out of this was a sore backside, then we have failed at our mission. Because it should never be about that. It should be about creating an, an experience and environment that causes us to be inexplicably, ecstatically set free for the sake of Jesus, in whose name we live, we die, and we live again. Amen.